about Jesus. All about Jesus. All About Jesus is the audio ministry of Pastor John Hillebrand of Calvary Chapel in Bartlett, a suburb of Memphis, Tennessee. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Therefore, God's Word, the Bible, is all about Jesus. Pastor John is currently teaching the church at Calvary Chapel, Bartlett, through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. We are glad you have joined us today and invite you to open your Bible and your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit will say to us through the Word of God. And now, with today's message, here's Pastor John. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to love one another, also empowers us to be bold in the face of persecution, and also the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, truth that we need to have today, and also truth about the things of tomorrow. Look at chapter 16, verse 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Now this morning, in chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus brings up a very sorrowful subject. He speaks of his soon departure. But he also said that their sorrow would be short-lived, for he would rise from the dead, and his resurrection would change everything. Look at verse 16 again. A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to my Father. Now, we know what Jesus meant because of the advantage of hindsight. As they say, hindsight is always twenty twenty. If I knew then what I know now, oh man, there would be a few things I would have changed. However, We look back through the gospel record, through the book of Acts, and we do know what Jesus was saying. In verse 16, the first part, he says, A little while, and you will not see me. In less than 24 hours from this point, Jesus was crucified. He was buried, and he remained in the tomb for three days and three nights, during which, of course, the disciples did not see him. The second part of verse 16, he says, And again, a little while, and you will see me. So this refers to his resurrection. In fact, once he rose from the dead, for a period of 40 days, Jesus appeared off and on to his disciples and to many other people. The Gospels tell us that the first people he revealed himself to were the women, including Mary Magdalene. And then after that, he revealed himself to the disciples. The Apostle Paul also mentioned several other people that Jesus revealed himself to in his post-resurrection form. And in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 3, we read, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, Simon Peter. Then by the twelve, the other disciples. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So there was a meeting of 500 believers and Jesus appeared to them all. Now, what's so remarkable about that is that shortly after that time, the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman government decided to persecute Christians, kill them for their testimony that they had seen Jesus rise from the dead. Now, one or two lunatics might be willing to die for what they know to be a lie. Because they have some other twisted, weird agenda, they might be willing to die for a lie. But not this many people. 
So when people try to pass off the, oh, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, oh, history doesn't teach that. Hey, yes, it does. In fact, over 500 people, in fact, there are countless numbers of people who have gone to their graves, who have faced persecution and have left this life and gone on to the other because of their testimony that they had received and seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. Without him rising from the dead, we're still in our sins. Our faith is futile. Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at one time. The facts are in. Case is closed. Jesus wins. And those who believe in him win also. It's good to be on the winning side, by the way. I hate being on the losing side. I hate being on the... I, I hate... I don't like it. I... I Put on a good face and, hey, good game and all. But deep down, oh, I hate it. Well, I'm on the winning side because Jesus wins. And so he says, uh, over 500 brethren once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some had fallen asleep. Some had already given their lives in martyrdom. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. So, Back in verse 16, a little while you will not see me. He would be crucified. And again, a little while you will see me. He would be resurrected. And then he ends in verse 16, because I go to my father. There he's speaking of the ascension, where he rose into heaven 40 days after his resurrection. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 tells us about that event. So if you want to keep your finger there and turn to the right of your Bible, the next book of the Bible is Acts, the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 9. We read, now when he had spoken these things, Jesus was giving his final instructions to his disciples. At that point, while they watched, he was taken up. He rose. He ascended. Just was lifted up and taken away. And a cloud received him out of their sight. That would be pretty incredible. That would be neat to see. You know, the disciples were looking up. By the way, as believers in Jesus, totally off the subject, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're not going to be looking up at another ascension. We're going to be the ones ascending. The Bible talks about at the moment of the trump of God and a twinkling of an eye. It's going to be so quick, it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. Do you know how quick it is? You want to see it again? How about again? 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 It's that quick. Twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up. Be raised up, lifted up, harpazo in the Greek, rapturo in the Latin. That's where we get the word rapture from. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with Him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hey, we're not going to be stuck here. We're certainly not going to come back to here. Unlike what the Hindu religion teaches, you get one shot. They teach you get to do it over and over again, over again. Try to get it right. And if you do good in this life, maybe you'll come back better next life and on. And man, who wants to go through potty training again? Who wants to go through pimples again and blind dates and all that stuff? Oh, junior high. No, man, never be so. Did it once and it was too much. No, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Is it, gang? Get one shot. Make it count. Count on Jesus and it will count. So he was taken up. One day we'll be taken up with him very soon, I believe, any day. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, he was received out of the... Just picture them. They're just still looking. He's gone and they're, they're still looking. And all of a sudden they hear a voice behind him. Turn like that. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. All of a sudden these two guys just show up. In blazing, glorious white garments. Who also said, hey, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Why are you looking up? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now here he's giving us a clear reference of the return of Jesus Christ. The literal return of Jesus Christ. As Jesus is literally lifted up. He's literally coming back. Hey, there are even some people who, who, who love the Lord Jesus who no longer believe that he's coming back. They think it's more of a figurative, spiritual sort of a deal. You know, I'm going to take the word of angels over the words of, of old dead guys who've written big, long volumes of books on the subject. 
These angels simply said, as you saw Jesus go, so he will come back. Simple, isn't it? Don't get confused. Very simple. I love the kiss philosophy. Keep it simple, saint, you know. Who will come, as you saw him, he will come in like manner. It's clear reference to his second coming. So Jesus told them in verse 16, he would soon be leaving them, but soon afterward he would return. But then after that, he would return to his father. Or were the disciples ever confused? Look at verse 17. Some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this? And notice they're not even asking Jesus. They don't say, excuse me, I have a question. They, they, they hear what Jesus said and then, then they, guys, huddle up. We, this, is, this is odd. And I think it's odd that they never asked him. But they are asking among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. And they there said, therefore, what is this that he says, a little while? How long is it going to be? We do not know what he is saying. This wasn't the first time the disciples were confused. As you read through the Gospels, it seemed like it was a common occurrence. On one occasion, Jesus had cast a demon out of a man's son. And then as, while everybody was all excited, Jesus turned to his disciples and he told them about his coming crucifixion. But they didn't get it. They didn't understand. In Luke 9, verse 43, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God, the fact that Jesus had cast this demon out of this man's son. But while everyone marveled at the things which Jesus did, he, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. It was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. You know, it, it's interesting. After his resurrection, there were still a few things the disciples really didn't get. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came upon them that they really began to understand what Jesus had said. Even so, you and I desperately need the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds and give us understanding to the things of God. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians that sometimes is quoted out of context. It's quoted to encourage us that heaven is going to be so far glorious that we, won't, we couldn't on this side be, in, be able to begin to comprehend how awesome it will be. And you know, that is true. Heaven is, is eternal. I have a, a, a terminal, temporary mind, cannot fathom the thoughts of eternity. Heaven will be far better than what you can imagine. And if you think heaven is about sitting on a cloud in a white bathrobe, playing a harp and just going holy, holy, holy all day long, you're in for a pleasant surprise. It's going to be, it's not even going to be that. But this verse in 1 Corinthians really doesn't speak of the glories of heaven. It speaks of the ability to be able to understand deep spiritual things now. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We cannot begin to imagine, bring up in our own minds, or think with our own hearts, or feel with our own emotions. We cannot draw up from within ourselves the ability to contemplate the things that God has prepared for us. Not just in heaven, but also here. Verse 10 goes on to say, but God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The difference between having just a casual understanding of biblical things and a deep understanding of biblical things is the Holy Spirit. And if we receive the baptism of the Spirit, we will be able to understand deep spiritual things. The natural man cannot understand the things of God, for he is a natural man. But he who has been born of the Spirit is able to receive these things. So, Back in chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven. Disciples gathered together. They didn't understand it. Again, I wonder why they didn't simply ask Jesus. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him. 
Again, Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit hadn't come upon him, so they were at a distinct disadvantage. Now, in verse 19 of John 16, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, you will see me? Are you talking among yourselves about this? Most assuredly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. Now, that weeping lament correlates to a little while you will not see me. During that time, weeping, lamenting. A little while you will see me. Now, the world will rejoice during that time of not seeing me. The world, you're going to weep, but the world's are gonna, they're going to have a party. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A little while you will not see me. You will weep, you will be sorrowful, the world will rejoice. But a little while you will see me, and then your sorrow is going to be turned to joy. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, taken away to be tortured and crucified, the disciples fled. They began to mourn and weep over what they knew was going to happen. Jesus was going to die. And the women who followed him all the way to the cross, they wept, mourned over him. Jesus was crucified, was buried in the tomb, and for those three days and three nights, the disciples and his other followers mourned and wept over him. The world rejoiced. They were ecstatic. No longer would Jesus convict them of their sins. No longer would Jesus denounce their self-righteous, hypocritical religious systems. Hey, they had assumed they had gotten rid of him once and for all, but boy, were they dead wrong. Three days later, Jesus appeared to them. He rose from the dead. Then the disciples' sorrow was turned into great joy. It was such great joy, they even forgot about the three previous days of sorrow. They completely forgot about it. And in verses 21 and 22, Jesus likens that, forgetting their sorrow because of the joy, he likens that unto a woman who gives birth. How many of you ladies have had children? See if you can relate to these next few verses. How many of you men have had children? Let's not go there. So, <laughs> verse 21. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. Now keep in mind, Jesus said this before the wonderful invention of epidurals. And you ladies have had birth, you know what one is, and, and I'm sure you thank God for that. Medical science, thank you, thank you, Lord. Anyway, her sorrow has come. Even still, it hurts, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. It is amazing to me how this is so. I've heard that labor and childbirth are among the most painful experiences a person can endure. You know, it's true. If, if men were the ones to bear babies, the human race would have been extinct long ago. But it is fascinating to me. <laughs> Bunch of wimps we are, and yeah, I admit it. But once a child is born, it's ama amazing how quickly the woman forgets her pain. And she wants to hold her baby, love on her baby. Hey, that baby was the source of your pain. And you're going, oh, how cute. You forgot how much pain it caused you. Of course, a baby will remind you when it becomes a teenager. and <laughs> You caused me such pain then and now too, you know. But it's fascinating, a woman gives birth and she forgets about the, the, the labor and going through transition and all those stages and all and doing her breathing exercises and forgets all about that and is holding the baby. And then not longer afterwards she'll say, honey, let's have another. What? After all you've gone through, you want to have another? Some women have more than one kid. Two, three. My mom came from a family of 11 children. Nine daughters, two sons, a huge phone bill, you know. <laughs> Even so, as a woman forgets her previous labor because of the baby, the disciples were going to have great sorrow for three days and three nights. But then afterward, their sorrow would be turned to great joy as they saw Jesus face to face. Hey, maybe you and I might go through times of sorrow on this earth. 
one day it's all going to be forgotten. When we see him, all the former things are going to pass away. We're just going to be so thrilled to be there, so caught up in his glory. We're not going to remember the pain and the suffering and the people that did us wrong and all that stuff. It's going to be awesome. In verse 22, Jesus says, Therefore now you have sorrow, like a woman going through labor. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. See, Jesus' joy, you can't take it from you. His joy remains. Why? Because it's not tied up in things of this earth. That's what happiness is all about. Happiness is a fleeting emotion that comes and goes based on circumstances. My car's running well. I've caught up on my honeydew list. My kids have been nice to me. People at church have been nice to me. I have gas in the tank. Things are good. I'm happy. Yeah, but what if some of those things change? Oh, I'm so sad. I'm so depressed. This is wrong. That's wrong. See, happiness, sorrow is based on circumstances. Joy, however, is eternal because it's tied up into that which can't be taken away. See, Jesus rose from the dead. It's a done deal, eternal. He's risen from the dead. And if we hope in him, we will have joy. We can't help but have joy. Jesus is risen. Hey, these things are falling apart. Yeah, but Jesus is risen from the dead. I'm going to heaven. Oh, these people are upset. That doesn't matter because Jesus is risen and I'm going to heaven. Oh, you got this problem and it uh, doesn't matter. Jesus is risen. I'm going to heaven. And I say, bring it on, Lord. Let's get this party started. Doesn't matter. We can have joy at all times, even in our trials. Because our hope is firmly fixed in Jesus' resurrection. And his promise, that those who believe in him are not going to perish but have everlasting life. And in verses 23 and 24, Jesus tells his disciples that his resurrection will not only change their hearts from sorrow to joy, but also is going to change their relationship with God the Father, including how we should pray. You ever wonder how we're supposed to pray? How are we supposed to approach God? He explains it to us here in verse 23. In that day, after I'm risen from the dead, after I've ascended to my Father, in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So here Jesus tells them and us, that when we pray, we're to pray directly to the Father. Of course, in Jesus' name, not in our own name, not in anybody else's name, not in any other dead person or dead saint's name, but in Jesus' name. And we're, we're to go directly to the Father in our prayers. Now, how much of a chance would I have in setting up a, a meeting with Vladimir Putin, the current president of Russia. If I called up the Russian embassy, if I heard he was in town, and I just wanted to get together with him, maybe, I don't know, eat some barbecue, hang out, go to the Redbirds game with him, and see if he just wants to hang, I'd call him up and say, hey, this is John Pilavant. Can I have some of Vladimir Putin's time? He'd say, who? John What? And I thought that Russian names were hard to pronounce. Pili, what is that name? You know? There'd be no chance I would be able to just call up and on my, in my name try to meet him. However, if I was an official representative of the President of the United States, he'd be happy, or at least obligated, to have to see me. Now, I am not worthy to approach the Father, our Heavenly Father, in my own name. But if I come to the Father as an official true believer in Jesus Christ, I then receive immediate access, welcomed access into His presence. One of the many benefits of Jesus' resurrection is now we have direct, immediate access to the Father. This was an unheard of concept 
to the Jews at that time. They referred to God as God, but never as their Father. Foreign concept to them. But for us who believe in Jesus, being adopted into his family by, by virtue of the new birth, we can now call him our Father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. By the way, we dare not try to come to the Father in any other name but in Jesus' name, for God will not hear us. I was raised in a very religious religion that taught that God didn't want to hear from me. But if I prayed to his mom, then Jesus would be willing to hear his mom more so than to hear me. So they encouraged me to pray to Mary and to pray to other dead saints. Because after all, God doesn't have time for you, but he'll have time for his mom. That was the, the gist of their, their beliefs. Well, I read in the Bible, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, and that one mediator is the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. See, it's only Jesus who gave himself to be the ransom for us, not Mary, not St. Christopher, not St. whoever. It's only Jesus. He's the only one who died for us. Therefore, he is the only one through whom we have access to the Father. So he said, you're not going to ask me, but now you're going to ask the Father in my name. Look at verse 24. Until now, up to this point, you have asked nothing in my name. You haven't adopted your prayers as, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. You've not done that. Now, ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So at this point, Jesus is now encouraging them to start praying according to this manner. And it's not necessarily some, some formula. Let's not go there, because after all, prayer is not supposed to be some mechanical formula. It's your heart crying out to the Lord that you and he might have a heart-to-heart. -heart. That's all prayer is. Driving down the road, pray. Just, Father, how you doing? It's in Jesus' name, of course, I come to you. He's the only one who I can approach your presence through. But we do need to know that when we do come to the Father in his name, he does hear us. And if we're praying according to his will, we have the petitions that we ask of. Ask that you may receive, that your joy may be full. Now, in verses 25 through 33, Jesus' resurrection clears up all confusion. These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Beforehand, Jesus spoke often in parables, but after his resurrection, Jesus spoke clearly of the Father. This made a huge difference in the disciples. In fact, they went from disciples to apostles. D to A. That's a horrible joke, and I apologize. Let's move on. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit, after his resurrection, ascension into heaven, then the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit used them, the guys who were formerly so confused. He used them to teach the early church about who God is and how we're to walk with him. Most importantly, the Holy Spirit used some of them to pen his word, whereby we're taught about who the Lord is and how we're to walk with him. In verse 26, Jesus goes on to say, In that day you will ask in my name. Again, we're praying to the Father in his name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. God the Father loves us because we believe in and we love Jesus, God the Son. Therefore, we can come into his presence at any time. That's an, another wonderful thing about God's grace toward us. We don't need to clean our lives up, have a time period of paying for our recent sins, be good boys and girls for so long, then God might hear us. No, we come to the Lord in Jesus' name and we have immediate, open, and welcome access into his presence. Hebrews 4 tells us in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, earlier I used the illustration of me trying to approach a nation's leader and how he wouldn't receive me, but if I approached a nation's leader in the name of another nation's leader, then yes, he would receive me. There's a better example than that. Let's say you're sitting at home at night. Or, you know, geez, me, for example. Sitting at home. My sons are out together. Uh, and then there's a knock on the door. I say, who is it? And they'll say, uh, it's, it's Billy. Billy who? Billy Johnson. Is anybody here named Billy Johnson? I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you too much. Not too much. But... Uh, I'll say, well, who are you? Well, I'm the neighbor kid who lives down the road and around the block. Can I come in? Why? Well, because, uh, I don't know, maybe you have some food I can eat or want to watch your TV and delete critical files on your computer and, uh, you know, just I, I, my feet are covered in mud. I want to see how well your carpet holds up. Can I come in? <laughs> no. Go away, Billy Johnson. Go to your own home. You don't belong to me. Now, later on, there's another knock on the door. Who is it? It's Daniel and Matthew. They're my sons, by the way. Oh, come on in. Make sure you wipe your feet, but come on in. You see, the difference is they belong to me. See, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't belong to God. People say, oh, I, I, I pray all the time. Well, God's not hearing. Hebrew or Isaiah 59 says it that's true. Behold my hand is not short that it cannot save neither is my ear heavy that it cannot hear but your sins have separated you from your God. Your iniquities have hidden his face so that he will not hear you. The cord's been cut. It's like getting on the phone and yet outside somebody's cut the wire and you trying to dial grandma and Barstow, California, and you're, hey, Grandma, how's it going? I just want to tell you about my day. Hey, the line's been cut. She can't hear, regardless of how loud you yell. It's 1,800 or more miles. Even so, there's some people who haven't yet received Jesus. Their sins are still upon them. Therefore, the line's been cut. But if you receive Jesus, then the line is connected, and you, through him, have immediate access to the Father, because you're now his adopted son and daughter. And because you've been adopted vir by virtue of the new birth in Jesus Christ, you now have immediate welcome access into his presence. Verse 28, Jesus says, I came forth from the Father, have come into the world, and again I leave the world and go to the Father. He's again talking about his ascension into heaven. His disciples said to him, See now you are speaking plainly. Oh, we get it now. You're not using any figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. They thought they understood, but according to Jesus' response to this, it appears they really didn't quite get it. They were still clueless. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Oh, now you think you got it? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. You think you got it? You think you believe now? Hey, no, you don't. Right now you don't. You're going to be scattered. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Then he said in verse 33, the first part, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. That's interesting. You're going to be scattered, but you know what, guys? It's going to be all right. You're going to fail miserably, but you know what? It's all right. I know ahead of time that you're going to do this. I'm saying this to you now so that when it happens, you'll at the very least know that I knew you were going to do this. And I love you anyway. You know, God did the same thing with us, folks. When he came to save us, as we read earlier, we were ungodly, without strength, sinners. And the Lord knew who he was getting when he reached out to us. He knew who we would be, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. He knew our whole entire lives, yet he chose us anyway. He loves you anyway. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
These things I've spoken to you, Jesus said, that in me you may have peace. So the next time you might stumble or fall, just remember that Jesus chose you and he knew you were going to do that anyway. He knew. You're not shocking him. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I've sinned. I, God must just be horrified. <gasps> what have you done? You know, no, the Lord knew that. In fact, the Bible says if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Picture a judge, our Father in heaven, sitting on the bench, and Jesus, our defending attorney, standing before me. He says, you see what John just did, Father? That sin was on me on the cross. And that what John just did, that's upon me too. That sin, st stop, John. That sin, stop, you know, that's upon me also. And so Jesus is constantly defending us before the Father because He paid for all our sins. We have a wonderful God. Such, what kind of deal from any other system of belief are you going to get that's better than that? And keep in mind, Jesus is raised from the dead. We win. What does the world have to offer? You try to be good and maybe your good deeds will somehow outweigh the bad and you might not come back as a fly. You know, in the, I went to Nepal in one of the major religious systems there is Hinduism. To kill a cow is illegal. But you can kill a water buffalo and eat it. Can't eat a cow, but you can eat a water buffalo. Try to explain that. Where's the wisdom in that? If you come back as a water buffalo, you're not quite as good as a cow. Now, it's interesting. You can import beef from other countries and cook it and serve it. But you can't butcher them there in Nepal. Hey, believe in Jesus Christ. You're saved. Pure and simple. So these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Now, in the world you will have tribulation. There's a precious promise for you. We're going to have trials and tribulations from foes, from friends, and sometimes even family. It's just how it's going to be. From now on till the day we die, we're going to go through good times and bad times. That's just how it is. The difference for the believer is we have the Lord with us through all those things. And he promises that those things hard times are going to somehow translate themselves into future eternal glory. Reward in heaven. That's going to be cool. So in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And he rose from the dead to prove the point. And he promised again, whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Do you believe in him? Have you received him as your Savior and Lord? If this morning you're wondering, gee, have I? I don't know. During the closing song, people will be up here ready to pray with you. Might lead you in a simple prayer of receiving Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And if you're a believer and you're struggling in any area and you want somebody to pray with you, you also come forward. If you're having a hard time understanding the Bible, understanding spiritual things, then you also come forward. They'll pray with you that the Holy Spirit might empower you. Give, your, give you understanding. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, your word is so good. You, Father, are so good to us. For in Jesus' name, we, we have access into your presence. For what Jesus has done, his death and resurrection, we're saved. And we get to come to you, Lord, anytime we want, 24-7. And you hear us. And you also grant our requests as long as we're praying according to your will. Father, I pray that you would seek and save that which is lost. Any that are lost here this morning, that this would be the day of, your, of their salvation. Father, if there are any believers that are struggling, this would be the day of their deliverance. Lord, if any believers lack understanding, this would be the day where you anoint them and their hearts and their minds become illuminated by the power of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're glad that you could join us today for our study of God's Word. If you would like to have a cassette or CD copy of today's Bible study in its entirety, mail your request with the date of this broadcast and the scripture reference to Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. That address again is Calvary Chapel Bartlett, 8587 Memphis Arlington Road, Bartlett, Tennessee, 38133. We invite you to worship the Lord with us. Our service times are Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m., Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are located in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett at 8587 Memphis Arlington Road. For more information about Calvary Chapel Bartlett, please call us at area code 901-385-3854. That number again is area code 901-385-3854. You may also visit us online at calvarychapelbartlett.com. Again, that's calvarychapelbartlett.com. Our hope and prayer is that we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again at this same time, Monday through Friday, as we continue to study the entire Bible, which is all about Jesus. All about Jesus.